Culture and Leisure Services Board regular meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Secretary, will you call the roll? Yes. My paperwork here. <laughs> okay, we've got Angela Truluk. Here. Joel Fair. Here. Mary Mosquera. Here. And Kathy Parks. Here. And we've got Betsy Ronk, uh, virtual. Here. All right, thank you very much. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at tonight's agenda? Um, anything that you would like to add to or amend um, to the agenda? No? Okay. Uh, I would motion that we approve tonight's agenda as written. Second. Second, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Um, has everyone had a chance to look at the meeting uh, minutes from our last meeting on March 30th? Yes. Any, any notes, any questions, anything that you would say we need to change? Okay. Um, I motion that we approve the minutes from the Culture and Leisure Services regular board meeting on March 30th as written. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. All right, we have um, a couple action items on our agenda today. Item number three is review proposed facility rental. Wait, one second. Uh, is there any public participation for tonight's meeting? No? Okay. All right, um, action item number three, review proposed facility rental user categories and discounts for nonprofit organizations, use of applicable city facilities and make a policy recommendation for consideration of city council. Um, last meeting, we voted to send um, the fee schedule back to staff for them to rework and look at and uh, by the weight of the packet that we have, you did some work, and we really appreciate it. Um, but Molly, would you mind taking just a minute and uh, giving us a quick brief on what we're looking at for item number three? Yes, um, so as we discussed at our last meeting, and as um, and the, the one before that, in fact, as well, uh, this was brought back um, actually as kind of a, a recommendation by the city attorney to indicate that um, not all nonprofits are equal. They're, they're, I have found out in the course of this research that we have 501c3s, 501c4s. Well, that goes up to 16, and I just stopped at four. So um, the definitions that we have in front of us are not verbatim. They're uh, just kind of they sum up what that nonprofit represents. There's a ton of legalese that we could have thrown into this that talked about, you know, who's tax deductible, who's not tax deductible, um, differences between charitable and faith-based, differences between charitable and um, social welfare organizations. There's a lot of blurry lines as far as who's eligible for what, and as I learned that most 501c3s could register as 501c4s if that fit their needs. So there's a little bit of flexibility. So the reason I selected specifically the 501c3s and the 501c4s is that so far in the eight years I've been here, those are the, the two types of nonprofits that, that come to us. And the reason that I included the 501c4 is because that's what most homeowner associations are. So the majority of the um, people that have rented our facilities in the past and or uh, held an event in the city and requested some type of waiver always fell under one of those two, two categories. Um, the Nancy Hansen for a very long time was like Grand Central when it came to the HOA meetings for a lot of these condo communities. Since then, that's kind of evolved. Most condos have clubhouses, most condos do things a little bit differently, but once upon a time, that place was always like, it was a revolving door of 
Solana Shores, or Solana by the Lakes, like you name it, they, that's where they had their meetings. Um, and they actually fall under a social welfare organization. Um, that was kind of an, it's an interesting take on that. That was not what I considered social welfare, but I guess if you're looking out for people's property values and appearance of the neighborhoods, that is social welfare. So that's why I've included them. Um, private individuals, I wanted to, to recognize them as part of the fee structure itself. And I wanted to differentiate within the different options that are presented between, say, a national level charitable organization and a local level, meaning based out of Brevard County. There's not a whole lot of actual 501c3s physically based out of Cape Canaveral. So I didn't want to shut out like everyone. So I just limited it to Brevard County. Um, and then our community partners are basically different uh, organizations that we regularly partner with, whether it's contracted or not contracted. Uh, an example of a soon to be contracted one would be our Little League and our soccer organizations. We're developing MOUs for those. Um, a non-contracted organization example, um, last, oh no, it wasn't last, it was this Wednesday. Amy, our PIO, helped or organize a uh, bicycle helmet fitting training class. Uh, there's a certification that actually comes with that. Um, in order for us to get our people trained, we needed to come up with a minimum of three others in order for the Space Coast TPO to host this training to teach people how to get kids properly fitted for bike helmets. And uh, she put out a call and it resulted in how many agencies, Amy? Yeah, from almost every every um, law enforcement agency, Coco City, uh, Melbourne, it was it was incredible, and it was very well received. Everyone was very grateful because apparently they had had the challenge where they needed five people if they wanted to get trained too. So we finally were able to put that together. But that's an example of a, a community partner situation. We're not gonna charge the Space Coast TPO to come give us free bike helmets for our kids <laughs> and give us the proper training that we need to get them, get them on their heads. So the, that is the definitions. And those are the definitions from attachment three. Yep, okay. for attachment three, the first page there. And then the well, next page. I, I, this, is, this is Betsy. I just have a question um, on the categories there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, when we had uh, looked at what the city attorney had suggested and we were given the um, information from the city of Coco and we had looked at um, all of their categories uh, which closely align with what you've done, so that's great. Um, but I see two things that they had, which we did discuss, um, that are missing from the categories. So I just wanted to ask about those. One is uh, school use. Um, any schools located in the that the let's say um, are used by specially uh, any citizens of the city who send their kids to school there uh, close by. And then the second is um, local residents as opposed to just any private individual. Um, those were called out specifically as well in, in the COCO category. So I was just curious um, what happened to those two um, uh, situations in, in their categories here? Well, the Brevard Public Schools and any of the local schools would be considered um, community partners. And okay. when it comes to resident versus non-resident uh, rates, those are set um, according to the fee schedules themselves. This only applies to um, discounts available for special circumstances such as being a nonprofit entity. Because if you go to the next page, just as an example, you'll see a resident rate 
and a non-resident rate, and then the discount that would be applied to each of those individual categories within this. The, all this does but, is... But what, who would then be charged a non-resident discount versus a resident discount? Can you repeat that? Well, you have, like, okay, as an example, in your proposed A, you have national organizations get 25% and Brevard get 50%. But is that 25% off the resident rate of, let's say, the conference room of $88, or is it 25% off of the $92? It depends on the person actually making the reservation. So, for example, you could be a representative of St. Jude's. You do not hold a local nonprofit 501c3, but you are a local resident, so you would get the resident rate with the, in this case, the national level discount. Got it. Okay. So, so either way, the schools that are not um, public schools. Can you repeat that again? What about schools that are not public schools, so not part of Brevard Public Schools, but they would be a school maybe within our community, um, private in, schools? In the past, we have been home court to the Merritt Island Christian Schools Tennis Association. Um, they came in. Uh, while Gustavo was the director, he gave them, um, like our other leagues, it's, they just play like a flat rate per player. And I want to say it was 2 or $3 per player, so it was a nominal fee. Um, but that just depends on how the city views community partners. Because at this time, the only schools that serve the majority of our residents directly would be Cape View Elementary, uh, Roosevelt, um, is it Roosevelt? What's the middle school? Uh, it's Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High. Cocoa Beach Junior Senior High. So. But also our saviors, I, I believe, is, oh, is and what, our saviors. what we would be talking about because they're not part of Brevard Public Schools, right. but they are a local community. And so. I, w I, I personally wouldn't uh, want to charge them. Uh, but that could also fall under the 501c3, or it could fall under a contracted situation if they wanted something long term. I wanted to call that out so that there wouldn't be any, um, you know, discussion as to, let's say, yeah, our savior wanted to rent the gym for basketball practice or something, um, or on Sunday for a tournament something like that so that you know right away oh that's going to be such and such category or such and such rate well we can always if they're going to use that for a tournament i would probably recommend an mou which would make them a contracted community partner uh, um so or what if they were just going to use it right you know for practice or something like that. It, I mean, I just, so where would you, I, maybe I didn't hear that all, where, where would you put them in your category? If that school wanted to use our courts on a scheduled basis, we would probably try to work something with them where we developed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that way we're all on the same page, and at that point they would be a contracted community partner. So then they wouldn't be charged at all? It depends on, on, on what's, what's happening. There's a lot of variables with contracted community partners that, that would come into play beyond, outside of this scope. Uh, I, I guess that's a question then, is that, is that something that the city council wants buttoned up for so that there's not a problem like there had been with um, the ball fields where nobody knows how they decided who should be charged what? So is this 
is are we buttoning this up to make this more foolproof, or are we still allowing whoever happens to be taking the request to make a, a judgment themselves? I, I just wasn't sure what at the, surface what value. Yeah. I would consider our saviors a local nonprofit. If they didn't want to enter into an MOU and they just wanted to use it on a one-time basis, my gut feeling would say, okay, then you would get the local nonprofit rate. Well, that's why I'm just, I'm just asking, is that something that we should add to one of these categories just so that it's clear or is that Community partners, do you want to say, call out the schools, or do you want to? I, I guess I'm trying to take the guesswork out of it for the city employees. I understand um, where you're coming from on that, but they would have the directive, like for a non-contracted community partner to utilize our buildings for free, I would have to clear that through the city manager. Well, I guess that's why mm -hmm. I think maybe from the city council perspective, it makes it more clear that if it's called out in the whatever they're going to pass here, um, because obviously these categories are going to be um, out there as published. So then um, people are going to look at them and try to figure out, well, where do I fall and what's it going to cost me? And that would be determined on a case-by-case -case basis as it is today. I I agree with uh, Ms. Ronk that we can take schools and put them into one of the five categories and even write it tonight to where we don't have to send it back to staff to get it brought back again. We could simply say, hey, in one of these categories, we consider, uh, we could say all schools, we could say provide public schools, we could say any private schools then become a, a 501c3, um, but I don't think that we have to I agree that we can include that clarity in these five categories. We don't have to create a new category, um, but we could, as a as a council, say, "Hey, our recommendation is that all schools fall into community partners or whatever it is." Does that right. make sense? Right. Would you say that that uh, would, Ms. Ronk? Would you say that that meets y your thoughts? Yeah. Well, that's what I was kind of going after, you know, putting them somewhere, uh, only so that there, that it is called out specifically so as people read these published uh, categories, it, it doesn't, it, they don't think that it excludes them, or they think they're automatically a community partner, and so therefore they should get it um, 100% discount, whatever. I mean, I don't, whatever, you know, makes sense. Chair, may I clarify? Um, uh, if you want to say public schools are community partners and private schools in Brevard would be under charitable organizations of a 501c3, um, if that makes the, sense. the only issue with that becomes that not all Urban. private schools are 501c3s, and so um, th then you'd have to figure out, you know, what are you doing with other private schools that are not nonprofit 501c3s. But if we simply said, um, it, here's the other thing: is that c the only community partners know that they're community partners because they have an agreement with the city, and so they have non non-contracted and contracted mm -hmm. so but either way they've had a conversation with the city they know that they're community partners and so no one would assume that they're a community partner is that correct Molly yes and actually it goes a step further where 
if you're a non-contracted community partner, it states in the definition that you are hosting a public event or activity that is sponsored or hosted in partnership with the city of Cape Canaveral. So they would have to get our buy-in, which would come from myself, the city manager, and if it rises to the occasion of city council, city council, before they could utilize the space for a discounted rate or for free. They have to be an active partner with us in a specific activity. If they're not contracted. Mm -hmm. Okay. If they are contracted, all of that is laid out in the contract. Right. Got it. Perfect. Um, could we write in for community partners uh, Could we write in Brevard schools? And then that will be under community partners, so they'll have to, they'll have to talk to you to figure out what, what they're allowed to do, mm -hmm. whether they're public school, or private school, whatever it is. They've got to work that out with you, either in a contract or in a non-contract city partnering event. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Ms. Ronk, do you agree? Um, I think if I heard that right, that you, it, were you saying, Joel, just like all Brevard County schools go under the community partners? Correct. I if it's like um, something like, um, you know, the high school wants to rent the event or wants to use the event space for, you know, a fundraiser for the track team or something. Um, it, it, now, where would that fall? Because that kind of thing happens a lot in the high school. And I think it would fall under community partners, and either they would need a contract with the city because they're doing their own thing, or the city would come alongside and partner with them as a non-contracted event. And um, I, I think that falls under community partners. And I think anything that the school would do they have plenty of opportunity to come and talk to Molly and the city and say, hey, we wanna do this. And we, we recognize that schools are, are partner, we're partners with the schools. Like that's one of the, one of the things we're doing. So they can yep. figure out whether they need that in writing or whether that becomes a non-contracted partnership event. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think that makes total sense and, and it should just, um, <clears throat> possibly be added, like you said, to where it says organizations, agencies, or Brevard County Schools. Okay. Any other questions on the categories? When we, <clears throat> we are making a recommendation that will include these definitions mm -hmm. that will include a, a one of the five fee schedules. So all of this needs to, to be in there together, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, can we rewrite community partner? So uh, Ms. Ronk, would you make that a motion? Sure, Actually, um, I'll make the motion that in the Facility rental user category definitions that will be passed on to the city council under the category of community partners. It will be included, it will be changed to include reference to Brevard County School. That's sufficient, I guess, Molly? You said residents, Brevard County Schools? Just include agencies, right after agencies. So how I would write it would yep. be contracted or non-contracted organizations or agencies to include schools hosting a public event or activity that's sponsored or hosted in partnership with the city of Cape Canaveral. I consider schools either organizations or agencies depending upon whether they're public or private. That would be fine. Okay. Anyone second the motion? I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Okay, unanimous. Thank you. So we'll rewrite that. That'll be included in attachment three um, for definition of community partners. All right, um, and so the city's put together, um, the staff has put together three different proposals in, which uh, use those definitions that we just walked through. So you have, uh, I'll start with proposal E, which is currently what we have. It's a zero discount for everybody except the community partners that are already um, in partnership with the city and or have contracts. Um, proposal D, I'm gonna start and work, work my way backwards because they get more complex the farther up we go. So proposal D, private individuals would get a zero discount. Any nonprofit organizations, whether they're 501c3 or four, they would get a 25% discount. Community partners are 100%. Um, C maintains the same break out except for it changes the 25% to 50% discount. Um, the proposal B actually separates out the social welfare, the 501c4, and reduces their discount to 25%, but all other 501c3s get a 50% discount. And then you can see that proposal A uh, breaks out charitable organizations to national and those that are, are uh, homed here in Brevard and the social welfare, welfare organization. So any questions about the proposals for Molly before uh, we would make a recommendation? Okay. Would anyone have a, a recommendation that they would want to put forward and, uh, and have us vote on? I'm gonna recuse myself from the vote um, because for the same reason I've accused myself from past votes, but uh, I have a vested interest in, in the, the rent. <laughs> um, before we vote, I just wanted to make a, a correction. Um, I don't know if you, how these attachments are going to the city council. That the attachment three, the fee schedule, the discount thing, um, it has the resident gym event cost as $98, but online it's listed as $95. We'll have staff amend list. that before it goes to oh. council. So can you confirm which one's, which one's correct, uh, Molly? Is it the one that's posted online or is it this one that we have? It's the one that's posted online. So online, so they're both $95, whether you're renting it for an event or whether you're renting it for athletics. Is that correct? Byron, can you confirm? Yes. yes. Yeah, I pulled it off the website, um, and that's what it said, $95 for an event or $95 for athletics. It was the same price. Okay, and um, Molly just confirmed that, and Byron, gave us a scoop so we will that's a typo on this attachment and it'll be fixed before it goes to council why don't we uh open it up for discussion uh, amongst ourselves um again does anyone have a, a thought on which way they would want to lead I think that the proposed B seems to follow with what we've been discussing where we're separated out uh, this 501C3 from the 501C4 and seems to be a um, nice way to, to handle the discount so that it's still affordable for some of our organizations. Okay, thank you, Mayor. I agree with that. I also, though, like uh, proposed A because it gives a break to the charitable organizations located locally versus nationally, and they kind of go with the social welfare people. So I I think that's also 
appropriate that local organizations be given a benefit so they service the people in probably our own community more so. Okay. Would anyone um, make a motion for either any of these five proposals? I'll make a motion that we uh, adopt uh, proposed B discount program. I think it, it does well in separating the groups without being having too many. I think if we do the proposed A, even though it's just one more, but as Molly said, there aren't that many that are um, Brevard based. Uh, it seems like, you know, after a while you can kind of keep uh, adding more and more uh, defined ways of looking at discounts. And it seems like the proposed B is the one that helps us. It just sets us apart uh, on the 501c3 from the four. And it just seems like I think that's a plenty number of discounts to, um, to have to look at, especially when someone, if, if there's a lot of people coming to do those rentals, it's always just takes more time, the more definitions and more categories that you have. Okay. Um, so you motion that we adopt proposal B. Would anyone second that motion? Okay. There's no second, so is there another proposal that would be made? Proposed A. Okay. Would you motion to? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we accept proposed A. Okay. Motion to pr accept proposal A. Is there a second? Second. Second. And now, um, Secretary, will you call the roll for the vote? I forgot what to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're supposed to start at the okay. We're going to call roll for the vote for <laughs> adopting, <laughs> adopting proposal A. Angela Trula? Four. Okay. Joel Fair? Uh, Skip? Mary Mascara? Four. Okay. Kathy Parks? Four. Okay, and Betsy Ronk. Four. Excellent. So motion passes. Proposal A is what we will adopt have, to I send. I have one other question, and, and maybe it, it maybe it's obvious to the um, to the city council, but it wasn't obvious to me, hence the reason I asked the question. Uh, but do we have to call out facts? Whether you get charged the resident or non-resident rate is based upon the residence of the person making the res reservation. That will be presented to council in their summary sheet. Did you hear that, Ms. Rump? I, I wasn't sure about it all, but. The, the same the same way that Molly explained it to us, it will be in the proposal that goes forward to city council that depending on who is making the reservation is who is how the resident non-resident works. Oh, okay, okay, so it, it, that explanation is, is given to them as well. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, that was action item three. Action item four, we have a, uh, we're gonna review the proposed fee schedule for the athletic field rentals and make a recommend recommendation for consideration to city council. Um, Molly, would you give us a, a quick briefing on where we're at currently with field rentals and um, yeah, just a, a quick rundown of this item, please. So currently, um, as you can see by what appears to be a typewriter print, 
Um, this hasn't been discussed in a very long time, at least not on the level of council. Um, when I started, and, and just as a reminder, I included attachment two to that, which explains where um, fee schedules for city facilities um, in this context need to be set by council. So when I started in 2014, um, there was a couple things tacked up beside our, our boards, you know, that told us how much things cost because we also had a push button analog register, Kathy can attest, um, where it, and you'll see it as attachment three and it just says ball field rental rates and, and it doesn't list anything exorbitant. Um, you can tell by the text, it's, it's, an, old, it's an old printout, um, but I wasn't ever able to find anything uh, as a resolution passed by council that matched this verbatim. So uh, once, the, um, once Canaveral City Park was kind of open for business again and it was no longer construction zone, um, and we had all new staff, I actually got a call one day that and they asked, well, can we rent our ball field? And I said, oh, absolutely, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, well, we didn't know because there was never anything built into the new system. All of my people were literally brand new and I was the only one that had ever rem remembered physically renting a ball field because that's how frequently that happens. Um, the only, there's really not, there's really not, a whole lot of demand put onto the soccer field because um, that's basically just grass. Obviously, there's a little more investment when it comes to the clay and maintaining a, a little league field. Um, but the real cost in all of this is actually with the lights because I don't mind anybody going out and playing on the ball field, but I do have a problem when somebody flips on the lights because uh, the average electric bill for uh, in season, meaning uh, how many days of practice do you guys do? Uh, it's almost every day. It's almost every day. Almost yeah, every day. So, so if the, and, and this is, I'm, I'm only gonna give you like the last six months because obviously everybody knows FPL raised their rates and everything. So the average bill during an in season month is about $560. That's only baseball lights. That is a separate transformer. It is even a separate bill because the first time I got it was um, in December. Whenever a utility bill is high for a particular facility, that director is informed because we rarely see the bills for utilities. Those are approved at a much higher level than us because obviously, you know, power, water, stuff like that. That's a that's a citywide type of thing. So in December, I was alerted to a high bill. And when I received the actual copy, just like you get at your house um, from FPL, uh, I noticed that it had a strange address on it. I'm like, oh good, that's not ours. That's the condo across the street. I was wrong. That is ours. I don't know why FPL attaches it like that, but because of that's the way the transformers were set up once upon a time, that's how we're billed for it. So, um, Without staff having the knowledge that the ball field is rentable, the lights should be charged, we ended up with a $560 bill during off season and that's, that's not acceptable. So one of the things that I really wanted to get in place was um, obviously formalize the, the, the usage, but really the important thing that, that, that actually matters at the end of the day with this one is the usage of those lights. Uh, for the next fiscal year, I have a retrofit planned where we'll be re replacing the lights with um, LEDs. That's, I'll compare them somewhat to the ones that we have over at the tennis complex, but the ones that they have for ball fields are, are, are pretty different because they're similar. You can angle them the way you can ball field lights. So. I'm hoping that with that investment that that demand goes down and that maybe one day we won't have to really worry about it. But for me, a surprise $500 bill is not cool. 
So um, anything that we can do to enable people to use the lights in an affordable means, but still literally keep the lights on um, would be a, a step in the right direction. I have a question since I don't have kids who play there, but Joel would know since he sees this all the time. Like who's, um, who's using it, especially during off season with lights? Um, it was a resident that was uh, coming in to uh, utilize the field for his daughter's training, and uh, he knew somebody who knew somebody, and they turned on the lights for them. Oh, so if you, in order to have the lights, somebody from the city have to turn them on? Is that how it works? Or um, well, that's, that's kind of the case now because we changed the locks. But, but I'm not sure if I caught what you said. How do they get turned on and off? Currently, they can't be turned on by anybody but the city because the city has changed the locks. However, okay. the written into the MOU with Little League will mm -hmm. be their access to use the lights, and any other uh, contract that we write would have opportunity to use the lights. And then how do they get turned off when they're done? There's a, there's a breaker. Oh, okay. That, that then they, the user can just shut it off. It, they don't have to have a city person do it or anything. Correct. They should shut it off. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and, and is the Little League, is that the... Is that like the city-sponsored Little League, or are there multiple different kinds of Little League? There's, there's the only the one, Space Coast Little League. There are other travel ball teams and other different types of leagues, which is one of the reasons that um, Molly's put this together, because if they're in town for um, something going on in Vieira and they want to use the field, We'd love for, and it's not currently in use, we'd love for them to be able to use the field. And now, if we have a fee schedule, we can actually say, um, yeah, if, if you want to use the field and there, you don't need the lights, you just got to reserve the field, we'll put it in rec desk, and then you'll be able to use it. Um, if you want to use it with the lights, you'll have to pay for the lights. But it actually gives um, some more opportunities for the field to be used. So... That's part of part of the plan. So in that in that instance, you said let's like, like say a Vera traveling team or some traveling team. Um, on the fee schedule there, where they say it's let's say thirty dollars an hour with lights, is is that like per player would have to pay thirty dollars an hour? Um, if you look towards the bottom, I'm just gonna I'm looking at proposed A. If you look at the top set of rates, it breaks it down by the hour, hourly with lights, and then a deposit if applicable. If you go down to the second area, you'll see independent, non-partner league use, and then that price is per player. Which would be for a season, or would that be for? For when, however many times they're going to be using the field. Okay. And we actually had that um, uh, several years ago. The, the only year that I ever remember that ball field being rented um, regularly, and beyond this one year, I can count on one hand how many times that ball field was rented by a non-affiliated partner, um, was they had like some adult intramural national Thing. There were teams coming, teams of adults coming from all over the country to Vieira for, I think they were here playing for a week. I don't know whether they did a little mini World Series or what it was. Um, the unfortunate thing with this one is that these were all adults, and when they got on our field, they wanted to knock it out of the park, which meant into people's homes and cars. So um, that was the only time that... Um, we've ever, in my memory, had uh, independent 
leagues come in or teams come in for practice and whatnot. And that's what it was for because they were all trying to practice and there wasn't enough um, space down in Vieira for the games to be happening at the same time while all these other teams needed to, to get out on the field and warm up. But that was one year. They haven't done it since. We've never had um, we've never had an issue beyond that. And now that we're down to just the little league field and not the, I'll even call it a quasi adult league field because that wasn't big enough for an adult um, league of that nature. Um, the the use is going to be incredibly minimal, but we need to have it available if we get the call. So, Joel, what's considered like a non-resident little league versus a resident little league? Is that by the league or what? I, how does that work? Um, I think there's two different rates. I'm just trying to figure out who's the resident rate and who's the non-resident rate. Yeah, again, it's going to be the same thing for um, what we talked about with any. Culture, it's whoever's it's putting culture, in the reservation. The majority of the kids, or? It, it's whoever's putting in the reservation. If they're a resident, they would get the resident rate. If they're a non-resident, they get the non-resident rate. So uh, whoever okay. goes into rec desk. So it wouldn't have to necessarily be, it, it could just be, let's say, a parent of a kid who's on a traveling truck or who wants to use the field, and they happen to Correct. be a resident. They don't have to be a coach or anything. Correct. Okay. And again, um, as you can see on attachment A, really, that would be only if they um, were using the lights, except for a, a non-resident if they want to reserve the field. Um, and, and that's what M Molly tried to, tried to spell out in each of these proposals is, listen, what we want is we want the residents using, using the field um, with, by putting in a reservation through rec desks, talking to the C5 so that we know who's on the field and who's not on the field, and we're, we're really making the most of that field because right now, um, you know, it, we, we didn't have a, a mechanism to make that work. So even though we're not charging s some of these um, different folks, it still allows us to reserve the field. And then we do want to make sure that if any lights are being used, there is a charge that's that's assigned to it because we can't we can't afford that. How how do you get an unreserved um, first if you have an unreserved general use but you want to use it with lights? How does the city know to turn them on if there's no reservation? They'll have to walk in the building and ask for lights. And the okay. signage that has been ordered and is ready to go up on the gates will explain all of that to anybody that would just walk up to it. And it would be also posted to the website so that the people that are coming in from out of town can have access to that information as well. And you can see that in the proposals that actually the rate is the same, whether it's unreserved or reserved. Really all we're doing is you're getting exclusive use if it's reserved, if it's if you're just coming up on a day and you just want to use the ball field and you need the lights, you're gonna you're gonna have to pay for the lights, but you have to come in, rent the facility. So does that make sense? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, three proposals in front of us. The, the increment is, uh, looks like about $5 increase in each of the, each proposal. Um, any questions 
uh, about those that we haven't covered yet. If not, um, would someone make a motion to approve, to recommend one of these proposals to city council? I just have one other question for Molly. Um, you said that that one month you had a $500 bill for life. Um, what would you just say is the average cost per month if you were to look at a year? I'll have to do the math on that and uh, talk to finance for the off off months, and I can get back to you on that. I guess I was just kind of trying to, uh, you know, look to say, well, if it was 500 every month, then we may want to go with proposal C because, you know, that's the highest rate. But if it's like, oh, that was just a uh, special cause of that one person who knew somebody who, you know, got the lights turned off. Um, then, and the fact is that, you know, based upon when kids play and they don't always have, or do they always have lights on? I don't know. Um, if it's only, you know, averaged out other times at $100 a month or something, well, then maybe you know, a lower amount would be uh, all that would be necessary. There are considerable variables in FPL, which is what I discovered in my research into finding out why in December I had a $560 bill. Um, FPL, and, and I guess I'm showing my age, but um, once upon a time it used to cost less money to call long distance at night. That's how FPL works too now. And if you look at different bills, depending on different times a year, they charge you a different rate based on demand. And that was one of the issues that came up um, with December because I had an extensive conversation with um, one of the ladies that works at FPL to try to understand why the bill was so high. Um, but like I said, this use is so minimal that I just want, the only thing I'm really interested in doing is recouping what is being used that is outside of what we plan for every year in support of our Little League operations. I think um, one other pertinent piece of information is that normally Little League is not uh, running from mid-November to mid-January, and then um, and then over the summer. But the summer, you could get a lot of use, and you won't need the lights because you have the longer daylight hours. So um, definitely some some opportunities there to get the field used more. Um, and and really, we're just trying to regulate consciousness of using the lights <laughs> and yeah. and that it is that it, there is a fee involved any recommendations for uh, a proposed fee schedule well it seems kind of hard to make a recommendation if we really don't know what the how much it's being used based upon the billing, especially now that it's been, let's say, more secured as far as turning it on. Um, so obviously, we don't want to create a hardship, but then we also don't want to um, have city have huge bills all the time. Right. I would. Uh... I would say that until we get better, we need to have a proposal. The, there needs to be a fee for using the field with lights. Um, and then we can revisit after a year of seeing w how much uh, income has come in and how much we've paid and did we, um, did we cover the costs. Again, we're not, just like the, the C5, we're, 
the goal is not to, even to to make money or even to have a zero cost. Like we're trying to serve the community with both of these things. And so um, we're trying to limit the cost for sure. But, you know, if we come with a recommendation and it's it's low, we can revisit that later on. We, we need to get some of these mechanisms in place to, to bring money in, to bring income in, and and to be able to reserve the field and to get, get use out of it. So I think that's what we're shooting for here today. Um, I agree that that it would be helpful to have uh, some maybe some more information on how much it costs, but at the same time, um, that is variable uh, by use and by billing. Like as Molly said, FPL has a rotating billing schedule. So even if we had what we had last year, that may not be pertinent for this year. I can make a recommendation. Um, I recommend that uh, we go with proposal B. It's kind of the, the midway point, uh, especially since we don't have all the exact information we need, but it certainly is something that, um, like you said, if we need to make changes after a year, we can do that. Great. And I second that motion. Okay. A uh, motion has been made to approve uh, Proposal B and recommend it to City Council. It's been seconded. Um, Ms. Secretary, will you call the roll for vote? Angela Truluk? Four. Joel, oh, Joel Skipping? No. Mary Mosquera? Four. Kathy Parks? Four. And Betsy Ronk? Four. All right. We will recommend proposal B to city council for review. Thank you. Appreciate the, the uh, thoughtfulness. When you do that, Molly, um, do you put on there that this, this should be reviewed, you know, after more data is available after a year or something like that? I, I made a note that uh, for my submission to council, I will note that we will, this board will revisit it in one year. Great, thank you. All right, um, item number five is received PRCA membership and day pass report reflecting metrics from January 1st to 2023 through May 17th and set a date for a special meeting in June to provide formal recommendation for city council consideration at the July 18, 2023 regular meeting. Um, we have quite a bit of data for action item number five. Um, we have the community center memberships and how many active memberships we have. Um, we have the day passes. We have the benefit program. Um, we have the Nancy Hansen Recreational Center membership program and the day passes. And then you have, at the very back, you have four pages of financials. And 10-point um, font. So we... We're not making the recommendation today. We're simply setting, we have, we're getting the metrics. So thank you for presenting those to us. That's super helpful. Um, it's gonna help us make some informed decisions. So take those metrics with you and then we need to come back next month and uh, come up with a recommendation based on what we've seen in usage of the Nancy, Nancy Hansen Center and the C5. Uh, a, a proposal for fee schedules, which again, one of those proposals will be to keep it as it is, and then we will have uh, other options there. Um, does everybody understand what, what we're asking for item number five? Okay. Um, I, I have some questions about the data um, that Molly probably can easily answer. Uh, one is on the um, benefit programs and the numbers that are there, are those numbers then would not be included in the prior pages, attachment one, first page, where it has all of the other people who sign up 
that those are two are kept separate except for the employees? Yes, these are these are people that utilize um, uh, programs that are offered through their insurance or their Medicare. I thought it was important to include these numbers because they aren't they're not part of the other membership data. And one of the things that I, I wanted that a lot of people have asked, um, because everyone wants to make sure that the people that you know are most are best served by not only this facility, but by the the prices and the opportunities that we have. Um, everybody has always been very um, intent on making sure that the seniors are taken care of. In order to be part of most of these um, these programs, I think the Ash Fitness and the Silver Sneakers, um, and Byron can correct me if I'm wrong, you have to be a senior in order to, to utilize those benefits. So I wanted to, I mean, when I started looking at the number of you know, resident seniors that were, you know, annual members or monthly members or even doing drop-in, I was kind of surprised. And then um, that's when I, I looked at the, the Ash Fitness, the Renew Active One Pass and the Silver Sneakers and I realized that's where, that's where they all were. So people are taking advantage of their um, insurance companies uh, programs that you know are designed to keep their keep their costs low and keep them in the best shape possible, and I thought it was Im valuable to include the revenue that's generated by them because obviously, um, when it comes to these types of organizations, they give us a flat fee. They don't care what we charge. They don't care how much other people have to come in and pay. This is what they're offering. Take it or leave it. Either help our our customers or don't. So um, these three are the ones, uh, so especially silver sneakers that we got asked about the most. Um, and so far that they're, they're taking care of a lot of our residents. So I wanted to make sure that you saw those numbers as well because those are part of the overall picture of users to that facility. Unfortunately, unless there's gonna be some pretty dramatic changes at the Nancy Hansen, um, that facility will not be eligible for inclusion. Um, is that revenue for those program members that fifty-four hundred dollars? Yeah, where is that in the or where is that included in your revenue by revenue detail? Under memberships. Oh, so it's included with the rest of the membership. Yeah. And then is the POS, is that point of service, is that daily? Can you repeat that? Um, I was just looking at the all of the different categories of your revenue there, and um, the POS, I'm assuming that means point of service, and is that the daily rentals or what it, or, or daily? That's, that's soda and Gatorade. That's, that's POS sales. Those are, um, that's like soda and Gatorade and um, apparel. Um. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's other non-people non, uh, cost or whatever charges. Correct. Yes. Okay. So where, where is, is the um, daily membership or the daily usage that's included in the regular memberships, or? So you're asking where is the where is the members. daily drop-in fee? That's under members. Okay, under mem memberships. Yeah, I mean, I see it as a day pass down below, so that makes sense. Um, but down below in the memberships, I didn't see the, um, the program, so then I thought maybe um, that's not included in that. I wasn't going to add all that up and see if it's balanced. But. So if you go to the memberships, um, the, that first uh, page after the summary, you'll see all of the categories that are, that are included in that. 
to include day pass drop-ins. Okay. Except it doesn't include, it doesn't show the money from the benefit program. I had to provide those separate because those aren't rung into our register. Those are checks sent to us by those companies and entered in by our finance department. Got it. So this data comes from the software that we use at the facilities to check in residents. So all your memberships is coming through Rec Desk. Yeah. But these program registrations come directly outside of Rec Desk to the city to finance. Yeah, they Perfect. send us a bill or they send us a, a check each month Got or it. a direct deposit. Thank you so much. So that so that's included in the fifty five thousand membership total. Is that what you're saying then? To nope. my understanding. Okay. I can verify with finance if you'd like. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious because that's a large amount, and like you said, it's it's nice to see that 106 people are using it, um, but it's you know I I just didn't know if you called it out separately because you couldn't find it in here or what. So it wasn't reflected in the normal membership rates. That that's the only reason I provided it. I have a question. Um, do we have the cost? Would, would it be possible to get us um, the cost for staffing and facilities and all that for the six months so that we can have that as kind of a, an understanding of like how much our, you know, what's our difference right now okay. between uh, our operating costs and our revenue? Um, because I think. Not that, again. Not that we're trying to make money, or or even not realize. You know, we're, we know this is a service to the community, so it's going to cost the city some. But it would be good to know what is the cost of running the facility. Okay. Um, both, if we can separate it out to C five and Nancy Hansen, so we can kind of get that great. I, but also, I realize that you have employees that go, you know, from place to place, and you also have supplies that you would order for one and if you needed it, you know, so it's not going to be complete, but anything that you could help us with an understanding of that, I think that would be helpful to give a recommendation going forward. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll work with our HR director. She'll be back in the office next week. Um, I'll work with her and come up with the staffing numbers. And then um, we've also, I've also had both my facility managers um, and John as well working on O&M for every single property that we have. Okay. Um, there, like you said, there are some things that are shared within right. the department, right. um, but we can kind of, we, we know what costs us and what doesn't. Like Great. Wagner Park does not have much of a demand. It only has a water bill, so. Okay, thank you. Um, but, uh, I just wanted to thank you, Joel, for asking for that, thank you to ask for that, because obviously we're trying to do our due diligence, but I realized too, um, the city council is going into their budget discussions, so this would be a big help uh, to them, I'm sure, to know what, if we let they kept it the same, um, what they had to budget as far as uh, out of their budget as an overage here for the C5. Okay. Thank you. Um, what? Chair, if I may, um, for the actionable item in this, right? Because um, we are, we do, we do compete for this space um, with uh, several other boards. <coughs> I was going to recommend that we, um, even though it's a an off month, that we utilize the last Thursday of June. Um, and if that's doable for everyone here. And that's um, June 29? June 29. Okay. That would be my first recommendation because that will also allow a little bit more time for research. Right. Uh, the other available date, I believe, was the Friday the 15th. 
um, June, Friday, Friday the 16th, or sorry, Thursday the 15th. Um, that one's open as well, but that'll be a really quick turnaround. Um, and I'm not sure how long it'll take me to get the, the staffing calculated and balanced between the two facilities. Okay. Um, would everyone that's here be available on the 29th of, of June? All right, Ms. Ronk, would you be available on the 29th of June? Ms. Ronk? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I will, I'm just looking at my calendar. Um, I can call in for the meeting. I can't be there for the quorum. Okay. Um, I'm currently up north helping my brother who's going through cancer treatment. So okay. I do plan to be back for the July meeting, but I won't be able to make it for the June meeting. Okay. So as long as we have these four, we'll still have quorum and she'll be able to participate. Okay. Well then let's, uh, let's take that as the action item. Um, I would motion that we convene on June 29th for uh, a special meeting to come up with a recommendation for fee schedules using all the information that we've received. Would anyone second that? I'll second. Um, will you call the roll, Ms. Secretary? Angela Truick? Four. Joel Fair? Four. Mary Mosquera? Four. Kathy Parks? Four. And Betsy Ronk? Four. Excellent. All right, that is the last of our action items and we'll move on to staff reports. Mr. Mayberry. We have, uh, we have contracted a gentleman who is handling the um, maintenance on the splash pad. You might've noticed it's up and running pretty much all the time now. He's um, well versed in this and has done a lot to help us get things corrected that we didn't know were wrong. Um, and he's continuing to help us going forward uh, until we have the uh, contract. We've got uh, three bids in now. Okay. But we got him, he was, we needed help. Great. Um, and we're in the process of discussing, there's a lot of talk out in town about having the facility open seven days a week and we're addressing that now there's a few different issues there we've got to work through but uh that's on the on the plate that'll that'll most likely come before this board in july okay um other than that um if you want to uh, everybody comes to the uh next friday fest we've uh you know, there have been talk about things that are going to be planned for the Civic Hub. Um, we had the guys go out and we did a small, like, test area, if you will. Since we had to do away with the bounce houses because of the problem we had with the activity in there, the fighting and whatnot, uh, we've noticed that a lot of those kids have moved over into the Zero Skate Park next, between the parking lot uh, where the band is and the dog park. And the parents have also kind of migrated there with them, and it's been pretty nice, self contained Not a lot of trouble. We've only had a couple of small instances, and we were happy to see them, and they were taken care of right away. So we talked, uh, Molly and I and Marcy got together and talked about uh, enhancing that area because it's so dark in there at night. And so we had the guys go in. We got some uh, four by four posts, and Molly got some of these uh, festoon lights. Um, so they're, they're set up in there already. So they'll be, we'll have them on at Friday Fest. I turned them on one night, they look nice. It's, uh, it's really nice. So now we're looking at what we can do to make that area a little more attractive and family friendly. And event friendly as yes. well. Great, thank you. Have you noticed, um, 
a decline in attendance for Friday Fest for the last two because we haven't had the bounce house or no, anything? No, we've the because only thing that uh, we've had people, Amy and I, usually at the uh, city table have people come up and want to know why it's not there anymore. And, you know, there's nothing to do but be honest with them and say it was just out of control. And, you know, even the police, it got to the point the sheriff's department really couldn't do but just so much. Right. Uh, that, that's been it. No, okay. no real pushback other than that. Um, when, the, when the police have to respond to your bounce house feature <laughs> yeah. regularly, that's serious. Um, right. we need to make some changes. But I do have a, a draft um, of an RFP for uh, in front of the city attorney. It's 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 quite a process. Um, I, I got to receive training from our special projects and our capital projects director who's been, who, who writes the, the amazing RFPs that get all your sewer systems taken care of. Can you give me what RFP means? Oh, sorry. sorry. Request for proposals. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, in, in the construction industry, that means they're going to come up with a design and uh, a cost and this is our, this is what we can do for you to meet your needs. So uh, we've done that in the past with surf schools. We've done that in the past with ice cream vendors on the beach. So I took a little bit of the knowledge I got from him and a little bit of the information that I pulled from um, some of our more service-oriented and less construction-oriented RFPs. And I submitted something to the city attorney uh, for him to look at, but it's basically requesting proposals for a children's activity or amusements host. Um, it took me weeks to find the right words for that because I didn't want, we're not looking for bounce houses. We can go get bounce houses if we want. What we want is somebody to host, even if bounce houses are included, a, a, a broader space for, for kids' entertainment and engagement. Um, the goal in seeking outside is to reduce the liability on the city and also to reduce the, liabil uh, the demand on staff. Um, in one of the instances, uh, right before BCSO had to show up, um, one of our staff members was actually surrounded by middle school students in the bounce house area as she was trying to defuse the situation. So um, she's like, I really didn't sign on for that. I said, I know. And she was a former school teacher as well, so she, she handled herself well, but I really don't want to put staff in that if I don't have to. So I'm going to try this route because I do think that the event does need to have some child-friendly activity, hands-on type, type of features. But uh, the one deputy that responded uh, referred to it as Thunderdome, and that's not what, um, that's not what I'm going for. So... Uh, Hopefully this works. If not, um, some other ideas have been thrown out there. Uh, when I was sharing our challenges with some other folks, uh, one of the things that was suggested was um, uh, they, the, the gentleman I was speaking with actually ran a sports booster club for the organization that he works for. And he looked at his buddy and said, wow, we could get some bounce houses and a business license, and we could use this as a fundraiser for our for our organization and I said well that would be a great idea <laughs> because that would you know that that's a win-win it's a win for your organization and it's a win for us because you're handling this now um, so uh, we, we have options out there I'm going to try the professional route first um, and then we're going to start reaching out if that doesn't produce because we've put out RFPs and got zero before um, so I, I don't know that uh, we need uh, carnival wheels and games and funnel cakes or anything like that. So what we're requesting isn't the typical engagement amusement type of businesses, uh, but hopefully we can find somebody local that's interested in providing that service. Thank you. Thank you, Molly? All right, where would you like me to start? The Cape Center. The Cape Center. <laughs> My flooring's done. Um, and it's pretty. Uh, we got the coefficient back, so we won't have to add any additives to make sure that it's uh, uh, safe to, to walk on wet or dry. 
So um, our next step is to get the certificate of occupancy and start knocking out the punch list. There's very minimal, it's 3,000 square feet, so there's not the 24,000 square feet punch list that you know we had with the other facility. Uh, but I'm targeting August as an open. Um, as I explained before, you can't just toss me the keys and turn the lights on and it's open. Uh, because we don't have vast collections, and I don't intend on ever having vast collections because that requires care, and it also requires me to load it up in my car and move it out when I evacuate for hurricanes. Um, it's not smart to build a big collection, you know, completely surrounded by water. And we are actually the high point in the city <laughs> uh, compared to the, the Radisson, I think, is the next highest. But uh, we're looking to, um, we have a couple exhibits that are uh, still in development. We have one that's almost done. So we put out a call, our first call for artists. Uh, we had an intern from FIT that assisted us with uh, this particular one and it's um, visual arts. It's on the website. I can forward it to you if you haven't seen it, but it takes, um, it takes one of our key themes with five of our, our big values that are in not only our vision statements, but kind of mixed in in our mission, vision, values, the whole package. And uh, it asks for artwork that, that illustrate those from different perspectives. So this will be, um, uh, this will be an amazing exhibit. I, I can't say what it will contain because it'll be very dependent on what, what artwork gets submitted. Um, and, and how much artwork gets submitted, because I'm hoping that we don't have to make difficult decisions on any of it. Uh, uh, beyond that, the uh, Veterans Park project went out to bid. We held our first pre-bid meeting. That is going to be amazing. Um, they're moving forward with the low impact development, the LID project, uh, which will actually enhance the I guess it's the southwest corner of the property where it butts up against that little back parking lot of the library. That is actually a, a functioning stormwater feature. Doesn't look like it, just looks like a little ditch to me. But um, they're going to actually expand that a little bit, dig it out deeper, and enhance it to make it actually a very functioning stormwater feature, which will help alleviate flooding on um, the next street over. Uh, Fillmore experiences quite a bit of flooding. So uh, that is underway. Uh, we're hoping that that will be wrapped up by the end of the fiscal year, but you know, if the last two years have been any indication, we'll see. Um, but at least it's out for bid and it's underway. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. We're getting quotes in for the um, repairs at Manatee Sanctuary Park. Um, as you know, that's like our go-to place to plant trees. Unfortunately, some of those trees are now larger and they're impacting our pedway. So we're going to install some root dams to prevent it from happening again, um, encouraging the trees to go sideways instead of out. And we'll be making those repairs by the end of the fiscal year. And I have requested some designs for the updates to um, Patriots Park. Unfortunately, um, what they thought $100,000 would buy two years ago when they applied for the grant does not cover that now. So it's actually going to be a phased project. We're gonna focus on getting the playground equipment fixed, or sorry, replaced, and then getting proper surfacing in so it can be actually accessible. Um, currently it's sand and um, a little tiny bit of grass. It's not very, it's not conducive to walking just in shoes and it's definitely not conducive to somebody that has mobility challenges or is trying to use a mobility device. So uh, very slowly but surely I will work in as many um, smaller projects as I can to bring that park kind of back to life if you've never been there. Um, it's, it's just wait, wait, wait till I'm done. Um, because we'll be uh, retooling the garden, and one of the items that I proposed in the retreat this year was Rover Space West. One of the challenges with, um, well, there's two challenges. You have no off-leash dog parks on the west side of town, so a lot of people use that as an excuse, if you will, uh, to 
not go to rover space, and then they cut them loose at Banana River Park, as Kathy can attest to. There are manatees. Six dogs there every morning. They're probably there Barking right now. at seven o'clock. So I'm trying to I'm trying to channel that, that energy <laughs> down the road, um, but also there's there's always a problem. You cannot have undeveloped park areas that are kind of tucked away. Um, that park has <coughs> become uh, almost a nuisance in some some months, especially in the winter time, because homeless people set up camp right in the corner. You really can't see it from the road. You literally have to go down. You gotta look around trees to even see them. Most people don't even know they're there. And I would be very surprised. I'm surprised we haven't received more complaints because literally they use the people's fence to like mm -hmm. build their structure with. I would, I would personally notice that if my neighbor was attaching something to my fence and living under it. Um, so we're hoping to discourage uh, misuse, overnight stays, et cetera, and um, also check the box for that west side dog park at the same time. And it's about the same footprint as Rover Space over here, so I'm hoping to kind of recreate what's over here with a couple lessons learned over on that side as well. Um, next up, concession stand. Uh, still working on that. Once again, uh, we had a project idea, we had a budget set, and things are well more expensive than they used to be. So we're looking at different options. Um, there's, uh, I was hoping for prefab concrete because I wanted a safe place for kids to go in the event of a, a pop-up storm. If the facility wasn't open, that's a closer place for them, safer than an open face dugout. Um, but I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get what we want and what we need uh, for the right price on that. So uh, I'm working with our capital projects team, and they've been, they, they're thinking of words that I'm not thinking of to do the searches, and we're, we're now looking at some of the companies that actually provide like the press boxes. Those are also prefab, not concrete, but still prefab, and they kind of have the things we need, like a concession stand downstairs and a press box upstairs. It's it's hard not to not to you know look at that, and it will also offer us the opportunity because typically people that buy press boxes and concession stands are schools and nonprofits and those type of agencies. So we will um, maybe have an option to piggyback off of a, a previously written contract and maybe even get a, a design that meets our needs without having the added expense of getting engineered drawings and going out to bid. So um, research is underway, uh, kind of like bounce house amusement vendors. There's not a whole lot of people that make these things. Um, and we're asking for something pretty specific that fits in a very small 20 by 20 area. So, um, I think that's it for me. Um, yeah, because yeah, we're, we've got a website upgrade coming, but you don't. Don't mm. worry. Two quick questions. Uh, anything Civic Hub wise that we need to be thinking about as a council uh, or as a uh, advisory board? And then the second thing was um, when they bring the new aquarium in, is that will we have any? Will the city have any um, responsibilities to that? And would they fall under Parks and Rec? Nope, that'll be 100% the zoo. Um, the okay. people that'll, the department that'll deal with them the most will, uh, at least in the initial phases, be the building department. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day, it'll be public works because uh, let's just say they use a lot of water. Got it, <laughs> great. Just trying to get an idea of uh, our, our roles and responsibilities. Yeah, um, when th for the Civic Hub, uh, where we're at with that, we have um, the, we're trying to get on the schedule to have the spot under the tennis court, as Kathy can attest, there's this weird little spot on uh, court number five. Um, I saw the dip in it before it was uh, resurfaced last time, which was about five years ago. And then a couple, <laughs> yes, and, and what's, what's interesting is I had forgotten all about it, and I was discussing the resurfacing in the Civic Hub process, project with the city manager, and he pulled up the, 
you know, the image from Google Earth, and I looked, and I saw, I saw a dark spot, and I go, oh my God, it's back. And I called, uh, I called over to Marcy, and I said, Marcy, have you noticed ponding or, or puddling on court five when the rest of the courts are dry? She goes, oh yeah, it's always right there in that corner. I'm like, all right, it's back. So we're pretty convinced that there's an artesian well underneath that mm. that may have been capped and is no longer capped or it was never capped. At this point, it's an urban legend because we <laughs> can't find any documentation on it. Um, and that court does get wet. But, and it does, <laughs> and, and it's getting bigger. And I, t I told the city manager, I said, because we, we've had it on the budget now, it was supposed to be done this year, but obviously due to pandemic and, and financial reasons, they kicked it out another year to do another resurfacing project. Um, I said, we're going to need to address that. And if you're, I mean, the, the part of the purpose behind the Civic Hub project is to look at the, that property's capacity to help with the stormwater problem. What we put on top is literally the icing on top. Everything, like the business end of that property and any changes, are going to be are going to be underground. So, when I had um, our sustainability analyst many years ago, he was asked to take different different properties and and determine um, how much water could be stored under each. You know, with what we knew about the property, and he said, "Well, underneath the tennis courts alone, you can fit you know approximately seven hundred thousand gallons." I said, "That's incredible. That'll definitely help the people on Fillmore right behind it." And I said, well, what does an artesian well do to that calculation? And he said, excuse me? And so um, that has now become part of the conversation and we're going to be doing some borings to find out what exactly is under the tennis courts. Not just to find out about the artesian well, but also to see what the subsurface of those courts look like. Because if it's constantly sinking in that one spot, that means there's something wrong with the subsurface. And those courts have not come up, come up um, since uh, 1976 when they were put down. So we have no idea what the underside of that looks like because it's literally just been, we just keep paving over it. Um, that's coming, um, I think we're trying to target that at the end of the month. We're trying to do it around different leagues so that when everybody takes their summer break, we're not interrupting anything. We will need to remove two of the shrubs and roll back some of the fence temporarily. Um, the shrubs, I can't promise I can get back in, but we'll put something in there and there will be windscreen and the fence will be back. But they're going to do a couple borings there. Um, they are doing some inspections on the Nancy Hansen to see what the status is on that building. Uh, in the nine years I've been here, the only changes that have been made were um, they did some minor reshingling after one of the storms and paint. So I'm not sure uh, the roof looks suspect. It's definitely going to need to be replaced at some point. So whether we do that now or down the road, um, obviously we won't leave a building in unsafe condition, but we are not gonna put a brand new roof on something that perhaps the community suggests could be better served as something else. Got it. So um, when we have a, a firm grip on exactly the status of that whole property, we'll be able to start having like informed conversations on, you know, the stormwater aspects of it and then the cherries on top. So. Great, thank you. It's slow, but it's coming. Anything else from staff? No? Anything else from the board? No? All right, well, I um, recommend that we adjourn the meeting. All in favor? I meeting adjourned. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Ladies, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.